questions in the chat and at the end we will be glad to answer you. Hector, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. You can start. Thank you, Rosalie. So um, hello to everyone. I'm very excited to be here. This is my first talk in IPAM. Uh, so pretty excited. Um, so hopefully we will, I will share some experiences um, regarding agile, agility uh, practices and also around Scrum that will help you in, in probably in your projects or, or somehow, right? That's kind of the, of the idea of this conversation. Um, so I'm going to start telling you a little story about me, about myself. Um, right now I'm working as an Agile coach for the project and I'm also the head of Agile coaches and Scrum Masters for Mexico. And uh, previously I have, in my previous lives, I have been an IT coordinator, I have been selling chocolate all over the country, the Mexican country in the Hershey company. Uh, I have also been um, an IT manager for Betterware. Um, and over here in this company, I have been a developer, a business intelligence, um, Tableau designer and developer, also a product owner. And also I spent some time in Germany um, as a scrum master with, with Audi and Volkswagen. And then I joined this uh, startup called Clip. Uh, over there I was, I started as scrum master and then I became engineering manager. So basically I have been <laughs> in, in a lot of places now that I think of it. And uh, I have also been a product manager and uh, then I formed a team also of product managers, product owners. So that's that's another part of the of the experience that I can share with you. And I recently created, well, recently, like one year and a half, I created this channel on YouTube called Scrum Express. Um, I will share the link later uh, so you guys can join if you want uh, to see some of the videos where I share some tips about Scrum and agility. And well, this is this is my personal experience. And uh, well, let's let's just uh, start uh, straightforward to the to the point. So um, I'm going to to talk about some Scrum best practices, but also some of the of the of the things that have worked in other companies or in here around what's going on with Scrum, right? So the first invitation that I would like to to do to you guys is um, whenever you have uh, where you're practicing Scrum. Um, I, so one of the practices that I have seen that works really well is not only focusing on the sprint goals. So let's imagine that these numbers are each of your sprint goals, but rather also thinking on the bigger objective, right? I have seen that this technique of the OKRs that um, I'm sure that most of you have already uh, uh, heard about, um, the OKRs are really, really a good technique to, to bring strategy down to the day-to-day -day tasks or developments or chores of our teams, right? So I think that the OKRs and Scrum work really well together. And um, as long as every single sprint goal that we create is aligned to the bigger goal, right? Over here, I wrote some example, just a, a reminder, objectives on, on OKRs are uh, aspirational. We do not put numbers over there. We think that we will achieve them someday, but probably they are a little utopic. So this is very aspirational, right? Provide our users with the best user experience. Okay, that's kind of our North Star in this team. And then a key result, probably two examples would be over here, the one and the two, like increase our apps rating in the Play Store for from five, from four to five stars, right? And then uh, if we have this very clear goal and key result in our minds, then whenever we talk to our product owners or if we are the product owners of the squad, we should be able to create sprint goals re very related or um, a very um, that will impact these key results, right? So that's kind of, I used to have a team actually that even in Jira or whatever uh, tool you're using, they used to put the sprint goal and in parentheses, they will put the key results that they are trying to achieve with each of the sprint goals, right? So that's probably um, not a not a best practice, I would say. I would say it a proven practice because best practice would mean that that we probably have been doing it wrong and that's not the case, right? It's just a proven practice that I think that brings alignment to the team. So that's what I wanted to share with this slide. Um, then we also, uh, I would like to also share with you the difference that I can see uh, between doing Agile and being Agile, right? So I have two analogies over here. You can see this guy, uh, Phelps, uh, swimming over there. And the, the, the story is like, okay, let's suppose that you guys, 
that you're standing in the front of a pool and someone is telling you, hey, I will teach you how to swim, right? So you need to put your, your hands like this and you need to uh, do this with your legs and then you need to uh, jump into the water and certain steps or certain uh, um, advice, right, that they are giving you. These would be kind of the practices like, hey, do scrum, hey, do stand-ups, hey, have a sprint reviews, have... But this is just doing Agile, right? This is just, and I have seen many companies where they just say, okay, we're going to do Scrum with the teams just because it's uh, uh, that everyone is doing it, right? But without being, without teaching our teams the 12 principles, the four values, the three pillars of Scrum, and without teaching them the manifesto, I think that if, even if you had uh, all the instructions, you will jump into the pool and probably you will sink, right? Or sank. Uh, so that's what I'm trying to say. It's not so important. Of course, it's important to do an agile framework or, or, or methodology or follow some steps and some meetings and some, those will help just like the other analogy over there where you are starting to play bowling and you put the, these rails on the sides. These could be the practices, right? But at the end, if you want to get good at swimming, if you don't want to, to, to go down the pool, if you want to do better in bowling, you need to learn the being agile part, right? The values, the, the communication, the customer focus, the constant feedback, the quick intera interactions or interact uh, iterations, right? So that's, that's kind of the message from this slide. Um, as you work in your projects and as we try to implement some of the of the scrum uh, frameworks or kanban or safe or whatever we should always keep in our minds that there's something behind each of the meanings and each of these frameworks right let's let's talk about the stand up right um, it's okay to do stand ups but i have seen teams that do stand ups and they just go over there say they tell what are they doing what uh, blockers they had and what uh, they have done and it doesn't bring a lot of agility to the business, right? So behind the stand-up, let's think of continuous communication, continuous detection of blockers, continuous adaptation for the team to the plan so we can achieve the spring goal, right? So that's the, the, the hidden part or the part behind that's, that's what we call being agile, right? It's not the fact of having the, the daily scrum meeting as long as like more that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is what's behind it, right? So that's that's a message that I want to share with you over these uh, slides. That's the invitation to always think of what's the the goal behind each of the Scrum events or Kanban or whatever we're uh, doing. What's the main being agile? Um, uh, what's the purpose or how are we being agile by doing this agile ceremony or event, right? So that's that's kind of the of the message on this slide. Um, so another message before jumping straight into the Scrum events and, and the tips over there, um, there's a story that I would like to share with you. So uh, this, 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 it's a concept and there's also an analog analogy behind it, right? So um, it, probably you have heard this because <laughs> most of us have. Like if you had asked uh, Henry Ford what the customer uh, were asking for or what were their needs, probably they would have asked for a faster horse, right? And then we probably right now we will have horses with uh, turbines or with, uh, I don't know, bigger um, feet or, I don't know, boots or something. And the idea is that behind the concept of jobs to be done is not asking our customers what do they want because probably they don't know it. And, and this is just a preface for the, for the actual story. The actual story is about McDonald's and their shakes. So these guys, um, the, there was a new person that joined uh, McDonald's a few, well, a lot of years ago, many years ago. And the guy said, well, let's let's uh, increase. They saw that the shakes were a very um, profitable product that McDonald's sells. So this guy said, well, let's ask every customer that buys a shake, why do they like about the shake? What would they change? What do, would they like to see in each of the shakes, milkshakes? And... Um, the guy, most of the feedback was, well, I would like it to be bigger, the, 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 you know, the case or something. Well, I would like to, um, I would also like it to be sweeter, or I would like to put marshmallow over there or chocolate. So they took all the feedback and I'm saying just uh, crazy things, right? But they, the, the, the goal is that, or the message is that they, they got all the feedback that, that they, that the customers or the guys that were buying the shakes 
um, had provided, and they created a super shake, right? A super milkshake. This one, this new uh, presentation had everything that the customers had asked for. It had the marshmallows, it had the bigger size, it was sweeter, smoother, whatever, right? And then they put that on, on, the, on, the, on the stores and they were expecting a big growth, a big growth, right? In the, in the shakes, in the, in the, in the sellout of the, of the shakes. And their surprise was that the shakes did not sell, they did not sell more shakes, right? And they were wondering, well, why did we invest all these and we heard our customers and I don't get it, like what's going on, right? So this guy um, knew another friend from another company and this guy, that the one in charge of this uh, uh, experiment, um, talked to this other guy, right? Which, which was like kind of a guru in marketing, etc. And the guy said, well, let's do another experiment. Instead of focusing on hearing what your customers want, um, let's try to focus on why, why do they buy the milkshake, right? So I think someone is on, if you can mute yourself. Yeah, please, thank you. So jobs to be done. That's the concept behind the story, right? So these guys, instead of asking the customers again what they wanted, they asked them, why are they buying the shake, right? So they went literally to some of the stores and they waited for the first persons to arrive and buy a shake. And they asked them, why are you buying this shake? Why not another thing, right? And they came to this uh, uh, feedback where they uh, documented everything and they found out that the the guys that were the, that eighty percent of the shakes were being bought at I don't know eight a.m. right from eight to nine a.m. and the reasons why they were buying the shakes was because well the shake um, helps me stay without uh, hunger every all the morning right so I they don't get hungry until like two or three p.m. that or one p.m. when it's the time for me to go and eat out of the of the office so it helps me deliver that job. You know, um, that's that's the term jobs to be done. So there was a job to be done right by the milkshake. So uh, just as this feedback uh, was um, analyzed, then they also said, well, this is something that it doesn't break because uh, um, uh, it's very portable, right? I can take it in my car and it will also stay cold or like for two hours. So that's also really good. And it will make my stomach feel really good, uh, uh, like uh, satisfied. So they analyzed the jobs that the milkshake, um, the milkshake uh, was fulfilling and that's how they came up with this concept, jobs to be done, right? So instead of asking our clients or our customer, the invitation out of this slide is to, to, to tell you, well, whenever you have a customer in front of you or a project or you're working on something, instead of asking this person, what do you need my service to improve or how can we improve my product, the one that I'm selling you or providing you, just try to ask them, what problems are we solving as a company? What service? What what is our service solving for you, right? And put let's be emph empathic and put ourselves in the shoes of this other person, and understand what are they going through, right? And what is the job that is being done with our service or with our product? And this is a whole new approach because after this, McDonald's instead of just selling milkshakes and trying to figure out the way to improve it, they said, well. If that's the jobs that need to be done by the persons that are buying this milkshake, I will also create a chocolate um, um, milk, right? Or I will also create a muffin that has a package that will also last all the morning or, you know, a different approach, right? Not as so the goal of the, the message over here is don't ask your, your customers what they want. Ask them what are they going through and what problems can you solve with their products, right? So. Um, I think this is aligns really well with the sprint goals and with the uh, the delivery and the discovery part of of the of the of this uh, talk, right? Um, so now I'm going to give very specific uh, uh, Scrum tips um, that have worked for me. So the Scrum events, and I'm putting over here. What about refinements? Because you all know, we all know that refinement is not a formal uh, actual meeting uh, related to Scrum. But we all do it, right? All the teams where I have worked, they need to do refinement. But I have seen that um, all of the teams, or probably 99% of the teams, still have a refinement session, right? And the Scrum Guide, the new one, tells us that 
the refinement should be a, a ongoing activity, right? For some reason, we started creating meetings and that makes sense. Uh, but the thing is, what I want to share is that we need to find the way that best works for each of the teams that we manage or that we work with, right? The refinement sessions, that's my theory. I think that they are not an official event because every team needs to figure out their own way, right? Their own format. I have worked with teams uh, where we do daily 15 minutes uh, refinement sessions and we invite one stakeholder on each of the meetings and we refine one story with the team. And at the end of these 15 minutes, uh, yeah, like a stand up, uh, we we end up with a good story, very refined story and validated by the end user or by the stakeholder, right? So that's something that worked for one of my teams. That's OK, right? Then I had another team that will do three hour sessions uh, of refinement uh, at, uh, starting from the higher level of the story or the requirement to the lowest level, the most technical part. And everyone was over there, even stakeholders. Some other teams did not have stakeholders. That's good, right? And then there are other teams that probably do one or two hours a week or every sprint, and probably they uh, divide, it in, divide the, the meetings or the refinement sessions in two, the high level and with the business goal, right? And then they go with the team so they don't lose time when we are talking about the business. They go with the team and they then they refine the stories and the PO is there for them and he answers questions, etc. So the, the message here is, Whatever works for your team, we need to figure it out, right? We need to figure out the best way um, to do the refinements. Uh, as long as I would suggest that we have uh, enough refinement during the sprint to have probably two or three uh, sprints ahead of backlog, that would be something that works for me. Um, so sprint goal first. Another best practice or proven practice that I have seen that works is um, getting to the sprint planning and having the, the PO uh, present some idea or some uh, concept of what should be more valuable to create during the proxy, the, during the next uh, sprint, right? Um, the starting sprint. This, I have seen that this first step is the way to go rather than what I have seen in many other teams um, related to the way they do their planning. So normally the way it goes that I have seen it is we have a backlog, right? Refine uh, stories. In the best of the cases, the stories are already refined when we get to the planning, and then we just look at the capacity, and then we just drag and drop and put over there a sprint goal, right? But sometimes, even in the sprint planning, we're trying to do the refinement. That's okay. But the 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 message that I'm trying to say is instead of first putting the stories in the sprint and saying, okay, team, do you feel comfortable with these ten stories? Yeah, we feel good. Okay. That's one approach, right? And then uh, the you, you say the product owner says, well, out of these 10 stories, this is the most important one, or these four or five have to do with the biggest feature that we're trying to, to commit to this sprint. Let's put that as a sprint goal. That's one approach. The other one is bringing first the sprint goal and then looking at the backlog and deciding what plan or what stories make sense for the team to take during that, that sprint so we can achieve the goal, right? It sounds like something silly, like that's not so important, Hector, but actually it changes the whole uh, approach and the whole focus of the team. So instead of focusing on the stories, we focus on the sprint goal, right? right? That should be the most important thing. That's that's my tip when regarding the sprint goal first before the sprint backlog, right? Gets defined, that's, that's the idea. The second one would be uh, scope may be clarified and renegotiated with the product owner as more is learned. This is a, I, I quoted over there because it's a controversial topic. But what I'm getting from here is um, there there have been many times when um, my PO or my developers and I'm the Scrum Master or the PO, um, I get asked, hey, Hector, we need to change the priorities or we need to change to remove these two, two stories uh, in the middle of the sprint and we need to add these other two or three. And um, as an agile coach, my Scrum will say, what do I do? What, what do you think that I should do, right? So over here, the Scrum Guide, this is part of the new one, the 2020, is letting us renegotiate, renegotiate the, the scope uh, with the product owner, right? So my, my point in here or my idea is that as long as the stories that you're putting in or putting out make sense, these adjustments or these um, um, adaptation of the plan 
if it makes sense in order to achieve the sprint goal, then I'm good as a Scrum Master. I think I'm good. I, I, I don't have any issues. And the product owner is aligned with the sprint goal and with what we're doing by modifying the plan. I think that's that's OK, right? That's my point of view, and that's what I'm getting from the scope may be clarified and this text, right? So that's another one. Um, not the three questions. So in the Scrum Guide 2017, I remember that as an example, if you saw the, the guide, if you go into the guide, the 2017, you would see that the daily Scrum says, well, as an example, you can ask these three questions, right? What are we, what have I done in the last 24 hours or since the last uh, daily? And what would I be doing in the coming 24 hours or in the, pro in, the, in the next daily? And what are my blockers? These were mentioned just as an example in the guide. And for some reason, we all went ahead and started doing the three questions every single day with all the teams and everyone is doing it still right now, that, that exercise. And I think it's okay, but I would like to share another alternative, right? The three questions have been removed actually from the Scrum Guide from 2020. So we don't need to ask that questions anymore. That's great, right? It was an example. We took it for granted, but now they didn't even put an example question. I'm guessing that because they were afraid that the whole planet was going to start again using that question right all the time. So um, what I can share with you is that I think that the daily uh, uh, Scrum meeting, the goal over there is to well, first, it's a, it's a meeting from the developers, designed by the developers. The format is defined by the developers only, and it's a meeting for the developers, right? So it's a place where no matter what questions you do, if you want to keep doing that, that's okay. But the question, the most important question is, hey, guys, are we, is the plan that we created at the beginning of the sprint still valuable, still valid for us achieving the sprint goal? Yes or no? Yes. OK, let's let's keep uh, working. Do you have any blockers? OK, but if the plan is not um, sorry, is not working anymore or needs some readjustments or needs to be uh, modified, then we do it right. Then we discuss how can we achieve faster the sprint goal uh, if we need to modify the the spring goal right sorry the spring backlog so that's kind of the main uh thing that should happen on the daily um that's my advice that's that's my tip right so not only a demo number four i have seen that probably 80 percent or, or a very high percentage of the of the teams still think that the spring review is a demonstration only and i i i think that the demonstration part is good but uh, it should not be our focus. Demonstrations can be done as soon as we get a functionality that needs to be validated during the sprint, right? What we need to, to focus or what I would suggest that we focus our efforts on the sprint review is on getting feedback from the stakeholders. I have worked with teams where I get to the meeting, the sprint review, and over there, there's no stakeholders, right? And, and, and the team is saying, no, we're, we're going to present this really cool uh, capability because this is what we finished this sprint. And um, they start presenting it. And then I say, well, well, who's going to give us feedback about it, right? Where's a user? Where's a stakeholder? And they're, no, no, it's just for us. And I'm like, no, no. The most important part of the sprint review is getting the feedback from the stakeholders, from a user. A user that will actually be using the capability should be over there uh, able to, to just try, even if it's in testing environment or whatever, or they should be able to get feedback about what's going on about the the if the product or the the things that the team is working on makes sense for them and if it's valuable for them right if they need to do some adjustments to the feature or if the feature will work for them and will provide value right so that's kind of what the message that i or the tip that i want to give about the spring review it's not only a demonstration the most important part is getting the feedback and seeing if we have to adapt the backlog for the coming sprints or if the strategy of the product that we're creating uh, is going in, in the correct way, right? So that's what I would say about the sprint review. Then we have number five, which is uh, related to the sprint retrospective. And for this one, I want to say three concepts. The first one is efficiency. The efficiency is uh, being more efficient is one of the goals when we as a team get out of the sprint retrospective, we should be able to have action items that makes us more efficient. More efficient, how, Hector? Well, with the interactions, with the use of the tools, with the access, with the communication, 
with all these parts, it's it's in the scrum guide, right? So we need to figure out what didn't work or what could be improved regarding these four aspects that I just mentioned, and then create action items that are easy to follow up, are transparent for all the team, and are. Um, I had a team that will create all kinds of action items, and then the next sprint, they will open the Excel, the spreadsheet, and they will say, well, another week without doing this one, and they will put a plus, right? Plus three, plus four. So the action items will stay over there for like three or four weeks, and then someone will say, well, this has been sitting in here for like a month or two months or three months. Let's try to do something, right? So this is somewhere that we don't want to be, right? Uh, and actually, the, um, the new Scrum Guide actually suggests that the action items that we create, and, and this was not in the 2017, this is very new, right? The new, the, the action items that we create out of the retrospective, they suggest that probably we could even put them in the backlog for the coming sprint, right? Not even like a normal story that goes to the backlog and gets prioritized. No, they say specifically, you can put the action items in the sprint backlog for the coming sprint. And that's because they want us to constantly improve, to constantly be better at the way that we create value, right? Our value stream management uh, system or process, right? So that's with efficiency, quality. So there are three concepts, efficiency, quality, and auto evolving teams. We went through efficiency, quality. How can we increment or improve the quality of the code that we're creating or the the potentially shippable products that we're creating every sprint. Well, this has to do with the definition of done. So every retrospective, we should ask ourselves or our teams, do, does the definition of done that we have right now works for everyone, works for the team, works to create valuable products that have good quality, or do we need to raise the bar, right? Do we need to add certain uh, things like this is not documented or uh, we need to put uh, this verification to the code or whatever, right? So this checklist, the definition of done is super important, right? So if, if you don't have a definition of done very clearly stated and very clearly defined with your teams, the invitation is to do it because it will help a lot. Definition of done, definition of ready. This is what will help that your teams not only provide better quality, but also to estimate, right? Because they will know where to start in the definition of ready of the stories and where the estimation ends in the definition of done, right? So this is just uh, another tip. Auto evolving teams. So the biggest, probably the biggest or the most important thing about the retrospective is that we need to make, uh, to help the teams be uh, uh, evolving teams, right? They need to be better um every single iteration right that's part of the retrospective so those are the three things that i can say about the retrospectives and in general that's about the with the scrum events um i will not talk about all the events artifacts and roles i would just mention what i think that it's important um then we have the scrum commitments probably some of you have not heard about this terminology or these uh, um, uh, concepts because it's from the Scrum Guide 2020. Um, uh, so there are three new things or concepts that we need to focus. They call them commitments, right? And the spring gold, you you we all already knew it. And the definition done, I have already talked, and we already knew it. So they just tied it to the to the quality, to the increment. They tied the definition of done. Let's make sure that the increment follows a definition of done. The spring goal, they uh, they created this commitment which already was uh, an artifact, but um, now they did it. OK, we have a sprint backlog. Well, it wasn't an artifact. This artifact was, was a sprint backlog, sorry. But they created this commitment, sprint goal, to tie it to the sprint backlog. So every single sprint backlog should have a sprint goal, right? That's its commitment. And then the one that I think that it's most the most uh, interesting one, it's the product goal, right? Why do I think it's good? Because I have seen many backlogs that have, uh, I don't know, 400 stories, 600 stories. Many of them are just ideas or something that some product or someone, some stakeholder threw over there and it never gets done, right? Or doesn't have to do a, a, at all with the product or the team that is working on this backlog. So the product goal is just as you have the backlog, which is the, the artifact, you are committed to a product goal, right? And this changes the game for me because now that we have a product goal, we should have, instead of 400 stories, we should have 50 or probably 100, right? It depends on how frequently we want to define in our teams a product goal, right? So if we are talking about a product goal that 
probably could be achieved in one year, then we should have a backlog with stories that only push us towards going to that product goal during that year, right? So it, it makes sense. So we will have more focused backlogs, we will have shorter backlogs, and we will have teams that understand where are we going, right? Because most of the teams where I have worked also just have a bunch of things to do and never know when are we going to end something, right? So that's that's not motivating, I think. So if we can engage the whole team or the squads towards having a product goal in their backlogs, then we should be in a better position to have better motivation and better focus and knowing better where are we going, right? So that's that's kind of the message that I wanted to give with this slide. Um, then we have this one, which is the three pillars of Scrum. So I have worked with teams that are really smart guys and they when they read the manifesto, the Agile manifesto, when they read the, the pillars of Scrum, where they when they read the values, sometimes I have been a Scrum Master and they come to me and they tell me, hey Hector, um, we are not going, we don't want to have five dailies, uh, daily Scrums. We want to have two. And I'm like, why? Well, because this will promote the, the way that we're transparenting the, the, our backlog and this will help us adapting because the other two days we will do this and this activity. So my point over here is for me, the Agile Manifesto and the values are over Scrum, right? So um, if you, and that's my point of view, I'm not saying that this is a, a, a fact or something, that's just my point of view. So every role, every event and every artifact should promote these values, the ones that I mentioned, the, the principles, the pillars, and as long as you follow those, probably you will get to a point where you can improve the, the Scrum uh, environment or framework. You could improve the way Kanban is teached or you can improve whatever escalated framework you are doing, right? So we will talk a little more in another slide about this. But basically what I wanted to tell you over here is that every time that you are doing decisions uh, around the Scrum uh, framework, if something is going to be modified or not, Think of transparency, inspection, and, and adaptation. If the proposal that you're doing, you have arguments around these three pillars to, to try new stuff with the team, I would be okay if I were your Scrum Master, right? So also, and, and related to this one, I want to talk about um, uh, this uh, slide. You probably, most of you already know this concept, but there's a Japanese concept, I believe, called Shuhari, right? So if you see over here, there's an egg or there's a, there's a chicken or something inside this egg. And the guy is just like trying to understand what's going on, right? Like what are the rules? What are the applied to Scrum? What are the events? Why are we doing this? Why are we having a stand up? And I think that we have all been there as agile coaches or Scrum masters, right? Where the team is asking constantly every time a new team that is just the starting with Scrum, they are asking all the time, Hector, I don't see the value between having five uh, daily uh, meetings every week, like every day, come on. Uh, yeah, they are asking why. They are trying to understand the rules of the game, right? The rules of the framework that we chose. So once they get it and they say, well, this is promoting communication. This is, they have the reasons. They understand why are we doing these meetings. They understand why the retrospective, why the sprint review, why the daily, why the planning. Now they are following the rule, right? They are in the shoe. Uh, this is kind of a maturity three-step um, concept or something. So when they are in the shoe, if if the scrum, if the team uh, mates come to me as a scrum master and, and they say, well, we don't have, we don't want to have sprint review because every work that we did during the sprint has to do only with backend. So we don't have anything nice to show our stakeholders. So we don't want to have it. If they were in the shoe which is they are just starting with Scrum and they are learning, we will still, I as a Scrum Master, I will tell them, no, we will have it. Even if you don't have nothing to, to, to present to stakeholders, we will have them. We will show them what's the value behind whatever you did this sprint. Even if you don't have, you're not going to show the code maybe, but that code somehow is related to some business value, right? And then there's a the technique of the five whys, like why did we do this um, database adjustment? And then you say, well, because the the database was really uh, slow. Okay, but why do we care if it's slow? 
Well, because if we added these indexes, then it will be faster and then the application will, uh, the website, for example, will, um, um, you know, download or, or upload whatever, you will see it faster, right? You will be able to interact faster. So if you ask these five ways, which is a technique that doesn't have anything to do with the slide, sorry, but I, I got deviated to that. So if you start applicating these, there should be a moment where you can, any single technical story, you can find the business value, right? So that's, that's what my answer would be. If the team is in the shoe, let's try to figure out what's the value and let's try to have the, re the, the review meeting. And if the team says, well, we only want to have two dailies. Well, are you in the shoe? Yes. Well, then we have to have the five, right? Whenever the team starts understanding the rule, uh, they start looking at why are we having all these uh, rules and all these ceremonies and all these artifacts, and they start playing by the rules and understand them, then they are ready to move to the ha, right? Which is, okay, I know the rules. I know what we're having, why we're having a daily. Uh, and I'm, now I am proposing stuff. I'm trying to figure out a better way, right? I'm, I'm looking at, well, this rule is okay, but what if we do this? What if we do this other thing? What if we implement to our process this tool, right? So basically when you go to the ha, huh, you start questioning the rules and you start trying to adapt them to a Mexican environment or to uh, 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 the context of your company, right? So that's that's okay, right? So over there I will say, well, if you guys want to have three instead of five daily scrums, let's talk about the the, the advantages, the value that that will bring, right? Let's talk about why, wh let's probably do it during one sprint and let's see how, how much value can we bring, right? Um, let's do it the second screen and see and compare, right? And if it works, probably we can we can keep doing it, right? So that's kind of my approach as an agile coach to the teams that are in the ha. But then there are I have also worked with teams that are in the re, right? And these guys have already uh, so re it means be the rule, right? So over here it's like um, understand the rule, then modify or adapt the rule, and then over here is like be the rule, right? You can imagine this when uh, this uh, Neo from the Matrix just uh, starts uh, 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 putting the bullets away and he finally gets it, right? Like he is the guy, he's the chosen one. Well, that's when you're in the re, right? You have a team that totally gets it, that they are like wolves, right? going together and communicating really well and the guys are delivering a lot of value they are finishing every sprint the sprint goal they and they say well we should be doing this instead of this and i as an agile coach i say oh, guys please be my guest right do it and let's evaluate how it goes and yeah whatever you decide let's let's just be the rule right be the guide right that's kind of how i understand this shoe harry concept and uh the, the message over here is as scrum masters or agile coaches, or even if you guys are developers or the, if you're working around scrum, probably this will help you have some arguments whenever you want to either decide if the team should change something in the framework, or if you're asking for, for your scrum masters or your POs or your managers for some changes around the way that we're working, right? So that's kind of the message. Um, what does the guide say? Well, everything that I said over here is my theory. The guide, uh, I don't want to, to tell any uh, incorrect uh, message, so I'm going to state the guide. Changing the core design, well, basically it says if you change Scrum, you're screwed, right? It, pro it would probably not work, right? So I'm thinking that this part of the Scrum guide is for the persons or the teams that are starting to implement it. That's where I see this text going and, and, uh, and I see myself pushing my teams towards following every single thing that the scrum guide says but as you as a team go from the shoe to the re i would probably start ignoring parts of this and probably i should not say that but that's that's what i think right so but you need to be in the re to propose or to change something right i have seen teams that are just starting and the second iteration they say uh we don't think that the dailies are worth it no you well, then uh, you will uh, see the value later, right? But you need to do them, right? So that's kind of the approach that I follow. I just wanted to share that with you. And then there's, um, I think, actually, I think this is the last slide and we have some time. This is the Spotify logo. And I put it over here because um, I also want to, to share that, you know, Spotify created a model and I have seen this model 
a, a scrum escalation model, right? With chapters and tribes. And this is like, uh, for the ones that do not know it, it's like a whole, it's like the alternative to SAFE or to LESS or, or to Nexus. Is a way, it's a framework or an escalated framework where you can um, identify dependencies and where you can work together towards collaboration and also, um, well, it's a framework, right? Escalation framework. Um, you can create um, um, a way of collaborating together that uh, makes sense. So the thing is, the message that I want to give is that Spotify did it for them. They, uh, they figured out a way to work uh, with what they have in their context. And then the whole world said, well, if it's working for Spotify, it will work for me. And I'm, um, I don't know, these guys, right? I don't want to say brands, uh, but yeah, Logi or whatever. Um, so then everyone started copying the Spotify model, right? And these days, Spotify is not even doing the Spotify model anymore. They are doing another thing that um, they invented, of course, and my, my dream or, or the thing that I would like to see at some point in the world that is doing Scrum is to have a um, X brand model or Y brand model or A brand model, right? So how I think of it is every single company should find their own model, right? There are models over there, frameworks to escalate Scrum. That's great. You can use them as a base, as a starting point. But at some point, we all need to do like Spotify, right? We need to find, uh, let's say, the EPAM model, right? Um, that's what I can say about Spotify and about escalation frameworks. Um, yeah, the, this slide is just a, a look of my channel. So my channel is Hector Cot. This is my, my last name from my mother because Morales is more common in Mexico. So I put over there Cot because that's how my family and friends and family call me. And uh, if you look for Scrum Express over here, you will find the address. Or if you look for Hector Cut, you will find the channel. I hope you subscribe and that you comment on the videos and put over there some likes, hopefully. And um, yeah, it's just an invitation to, to follow over here. And I'm trying to share every week or every two weeks uh, live events or uh, videos related to Scrum, to agility, to whatever, right? Best practices, proven practices. Uh, dark Scrum is a lot of bad practices, uh, user stories, et cetera, right? Um, and that's that's it. Uh, I don't know if we could address some questions right now. We have some some minutes. Sure. Thank you so much, Hector. Um, let's see the chat. I see a comment. I think it's not a question from Alejandro Hernandez. Um, Alejandro said, having two meetings per week are the best option for developers. I think you already uh, talked a little bit about this, but I don't know if you want to have any comment. Yeah, I, I agree with Alejandro. Two weeks, two meetings per week. Uh, you mean, I don't know if you mean refinement or if you mean uh, dailies. Probably you're meaning, um, you mean dailies, yeah, right? Daily, so, daily, yeah. Dailies. Yeah, yeah, I know. And, yeah. and I have to agree with you, just uh, just taking consideration the talking as a scrub, talking as a developer, I have also been, and I would uh, appreciate so also I. one or two at most, right? Um, but you need to figure out the, the maturity of the team. Probably yeah. if you do one on Monday and then the other one on Thursday, uh, if the team is mature enough, to detect blockers or issues and communicate themselves, you don't need to put them over there every single day. Every day if yeah, the, exactly. yeah, if they are not mature and they are starting, you need to build this momentum and uh, this cadence of communication every day, right? So it depends. It would depend on the maturity. That that would be my okay, my team. my tip. Get that right. Cool. Thank, Thank you, Alejandro. You, cool. Awesome. So everything was explained very good. No com no questions. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you because I don't see any more questions on the chat. Um, oh, I see. Oh, my God, they are writing. <laughs> so okay. um, let me just read it for you. Um, and when Monteverde said, how long do you think it takes in a parent, a team to reach a mature state? Um, that's a that's a tough one, Manuel. Um, what I have seen is I have actually never seen or, or been working with a team so long 
that I have seen how much time it takes for a team from going from scratch, like whenever we implement a, a start scrum from scratch, and then looking at a team that it's already in the shoe hurry, I have never been there. I think that at least a year, that would be my my guess. Um, yeah, it's it's not easy. It's it's not easy. I have been with with not a lot of teams from the scratch. Most of the teams where I have been uh, in the first six months, probably they go from the shoe to the ha or to the ha to the re. But the whole process, like the one year, um, I'm glad to say that I have not uh, been there the whole process because it means that at some point I did my job and I had to step away with another team, right? So that's that's something that I think that uh, the, the agile coaches or the scrum masters should make themselves not needed anymore at some point, right? So yeah, I would not probably one year at least. Perfect, thank you, Hector. And we have a comment, it's not a question from uh, Omar. Uh, Omar said, on this day, Maderhorn project, um, they adapt the Scrum methodology and I can enter to daily meetings or not. I just enter if I have something relevant for the project. It's just a comment again, not a question. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, Omar. Um, we have a comment from Estrella. Having to, I don't know what it is. is daily Scrum meetings. Daily yeah. stand-ups, yeah. Uh, yeah, daily stand up. Sorry for that. Uh, we'll be escaping of the shoe and have moments. So how can we motivate the team to get in that to a momentum and see the benefits of having all the ceremonies on time? Okay, well, the first approach, and I know what you're asking, why you're asking that, Estrella, because we're in the same project and uh, I know that it has been hard. Um, I would think that um, the first thing is to try to sell the value of each meeting, obviously, right? You're trying to sell sell them that you're going to avoid other meetings because normally you don't want to do so many dailies because, well, there are a lot of meetings, right? Losing time, what's the value? So probably I would tell them that these will avoid other meetings, having other meetings. That's the first thing. The other one would be um, that a blocker, probably cannot stay two or three days. So that's why we constantly talk uh, every day about the blockers and about how the plan can be modified towards the spring goal. And another thing would be, I, I as a Scrum Master can try to make it funner, uh, funnier, right? Like if we are asking all the day, every day, the same three questions, of course, I, I would uh, get tired as a developer. I'm on the same questions again, the same format. So the daily is uh, they could set up the format. I would say to my developers, hey guys, this is getting bored, right? Yeah, well, let's try to put another format. We used to have some, uh, I, one of my teams used to do, um, I don't know how you say lagartijas in English, like push-ups push or push-ups, push -ups. okay. So they will do push-ups while having the stand-up. So that was fun because it will be really, really quick because they will not be able to somewhere fat like me and everything. So they will just do four or five and they will try to hurry it up. Another team I used to play with a ball. I mean, it's hard right now, but we will get to the office somewhere soon, I hope, sometime soon. So they will play with a ball and they will pass it and the one that didn't catch it will do some stuff and they will have the word. So I think that we can sell them the value, make the meetings more uh, fun, like funnier, and uh, also tell them that you will not need other meetings if you if you have these dailies. So that's another point. And the fourth point, because I know, Australia that for some of us, at some point, none of these work. So the other one is just bring the, their manager and try to make them, if they are really starting Scrum, I think at some point involving the man management and telling them, hey, we need to do them right now. When this team gets um, more mature and get better at Scrum, we will be able to negotiate again and probably go to two or three. That's okay. Or, or like uh, the Disney Matterhorn project, right? We should. That's a good approach. I'm, I'm, ho I'm thinking that these guys figure it out for them, and they are not starting. They probably started with five, and then they negotiate these, uh, these uh, with the scrum master. And you can enter or not if it makes sense for you to enter or not. That's okay. But we need to to have teams that have already gone through the five dailies, right? That that would be my my advice, Estrella. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And I see Alejandro's uh, hand raised. 
Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Arceli. Yes, I would like to comment uh, what you were saying, Hector. It's like make to make sure we as a de as a developers and well as a scrum masters uh, to make to set everyone in the tune in the same page, because if, if we are following the same goal, in this case we can achieve it. If, for example, like in, in a soccer play, in a soccer team, we are focusing always to get the goal um, to get the ball into the into the into the net or into the um, into the how do you say porteria <laughs> into the into the other the goal goal keeping or goal, goal yeah keepers, something like that I don't know but at mm. the end if you are always in the whole team the the eleven 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 elements in the team are following with the same goal is is the same way to uh, to get to the what what Estrella was asking so. In this case, uh, we can figure out and we can solve it. So we don't need to have always five days to the meetings, or we need to to have uh, to a hey, you have to do this and to following. Just to if we are following the same goal with this, we can we can achieve it. Well, just yeah, to mention. It. Yeah, I agree. The the most important thing is remembering that we are all following the same goal. And this is the yeah. first technique same that they page. show you in coaching, right? Whenever yes. you have a discussion with someone else, like your wife or whatever, you should always, the first thing that you need to, to accomplish or to calm down or mitigate the issue or whatever is we both have the same goal, right? Remember? So that's that's kind of a, 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 the way to go. I, I agree with you, Alejandro. Yeah, thank you, Hector. Thank you to both. We have two more questions. Um, one from Alberto Gauna. Do the COVID-19 and distributed team, how good is to have communication channels, for example, Slack, to update the daily stand-up? I had a team on which we used to have daily stand-ups from Monday to Thursday and Fridays was free, but they need to update on Slack. Yeah, I have also worked with very good teams. Uh, by good, I mean mature teams that use Slack. That I mean, no, nothing will replace the face-to-face, -face, right? We, we, I think that we can all agree to that. Even the camera turn on, and and it's not the same, right? So uh, agile and agility and the manifest on everything tries to to uh, motivate towards face-to-face -to -face communication, right? But I I understand that we're in in, in uh, we're, we're facing something that no one has faced, uh, at least uh, the, the, the guys that are over here probably. So we need to find our way through it, right? And if Slack is a good option, I don't have, I don't have any, any issue towards doing the, the dailies, uh, putting over there, as long as it promotes the transparency and it uh, helps us adapt uh, if, if needed towards the spring goal. I think the channel is the, the least important, right? So uh, I would suggest that we use whatever technology we have and try to to do more, uh, to communicate uh, more and more frequently in the ways that we can, right? So, yeah. Perfect, thank you, Hector. And the last one from Manuel Monteverde. Any strategies or suggestions on how to set up a sprint goals to teams that provide production support also? Um, yeah, that's a hard one. Normally, when you are working with support teams, um, I would first try to think of why are we doing Scrum? Because I have also been with with teams, operational teams, supporting teams, uh, and it just doesn't make a lot of sense, right? Because you're solving tickets, you're um, you're not working actually in a software product where you can team up and, and transparent and coordinate towards a goal. So mostly is solving tickets. I, I'm hoping that I can, that I'm understanding it correctly, Manuel. So you mean provide production support, right? So set up sprinkles to teams that provide production support. Yes, yeah, support. I would rather use Kanban for support, but uh, if you strictly have to put over there spring goals, probably look at what the team has in common and not think of it as individual tickets that we're trying to solve, but rather, okay, if we solve this amount of tickets, probably if we, instead of solving 20 tickets this sprint, if we solve 40, what will happen, right? What will be the impact? 
that we can name it a sprint goal. Sprint goals do not have to be always about features, like we're going to put this window in this. Uh, I have seen really good teams that have um, a business goals, right? As sprint goals, right? So if over here you can say, well, as a support team uh, that we're providing uh, support to operations or whatever, this sprint we're going to increment our, our customer satisfaction for the service that we're doing by fixing instead of 20 tickets, fixing 30, then that's a sprint goal. That could be a sprint goal that all the team that is in operation are sharing, right? That's that's the common ground for all of them. That That's what I could think of. Hard question, Manuel. Thank you for answering, Hector. Um, let me see if we have any. Nope. Nope. No more. So I think with getting to the end of this talk, thank you so much, everyone, to join us. And thank you, Hector, for, for participating. It was an amazing talk. We are going to share uh, the recording and also the slides for the people that join us so they can review again information. And we hope uh, anyone can join us for the next Agile Community Mexico talk. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend. Thank you, guys. Thank, thank you, everyone, you. for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Questions in the chat, and at the end, we will be glad to answer you. Hector, thank you so much uh, for 